Hi, this is lecture 10 of Marketing Analytics. For this particular lecture, I'm going to be break, breaking down into two separate videos. The first video, we are going to be exploring what is data-driven uh, marketing analytics. And the second video is going to have more concentration on digital marketing analytics and also the power of social media. So the learning objectives we would like to achieve for this particular video are we'd like to understand how data-driven marketing analytics strategy drives what an effective marketing campaign can do. We want to also understand that the drivers of digital marketing and why it is so important to build a very strong online presence. We want to um, understand how social listening can be applied to social media analytics for social media marketing and this will be done in the part two of this video and review and apply some digital marketing metrics and how it helps to inform online digital marketing strategy. So first off, let's begin by asking ourselves, what is data-driven marketing analytics metrics? Basically, when we plan a data-driven project, we want to make sure that we use data effectively to maximize marketing effectiveness. This also allows us by using the data to uh, allow marketeers to maximize the efficiency and minimize marketing cost. We want to process the data accurately so that we report on the past, analyze the present and predict the future. If you look at the life cycle of one impactful piece of content, as long as we can manage this particular marketing cycle, we will know how well our data can be used to create a strong marketing message. When we create one message, we will be able to decide who can visit our site because the content will meet the needs of those people that meets our site. And then we have a thing where we get them to contact us and the time when we interact with the person, we will also have this person become a loyal customer. And as we each come out with new information or new content, this content on the digital space will be able to connect with our new readers or our new consumers and the cycle then continues. So. Imagine you creating a very impactful digital content just to reach out to one person and have that reach out to many more people who are going to be interested. Marketing campaign life cycle is about the process of creating and running a campaign through several stages. First, we need to design, starting out with exploratory research, finding out what people like, finding out what people don't like, as well as understanding what people's feelings and trends are. Look at social media analytics like likes, retweets, and shares. And then when we have designed the content, we can then have time to implement the content. Time to do everything to ensure that the campaign is a success. And then after we have implemented the content, we must evaluate to ensure that it meets the goals of the original standards that we have set. So take, for example, Coke. Coke designed by uh, their marketing campaigns, usually by starting with an exploratory research. Coke always built custom listening software on their social media to find out what is going on on uh, their social media and their trends to find out what people like, what people share, how people, what people comment. And then from these hypotheses of what they think they like and all that, uh, they always form the hypothesis on which strategies will work and which will not. Now during the implementation uh, part, Coke will use their data and generate about 300 customizable responses to engage with their new customers. They carefully, regularly, they carefully and regularly monitor these results and make the adjustments when necessary. Now, Coke, because they have done this, they were able to have a good social reach of over 200 million and increase the happiness exposure by 200%. 
This is how we determine how many resources should we spend in the future, if any, so that we only spend the resources on the campaigns that do have a positive response. The marketing analytics strategy goes in a cyclical mode. Phase one is understanding what are the metrics that we want to use to identify the success of our campaign. In phase two, once we've identified the metrics, then we analyze these metrics. And in phase three, we take the improvement actions necessary based on what the metrics tell us. So the success of the campaigns must always be measured. How much money do we spend on them? And of course, how to improve on these outcomes as it is a continuous function of review, identification, and applying the necessary steps to change whatever things that we need to change. So let's begin by identifying our metrics. Always start with a goal in mind and allow yourself to come up with questions that need the uh, data to answer. Metrics can help bring the meaning to the data because if we have uh, metrics, we are allowed to then use that meaning to give us a sort of an answer to what we are trying to find out. Metrics are quantifiable measures used to track the status of a marketing process. And metrics can help determine if the goals are being achieved. Just like we are looking into a consumption phase, if let's say we want to find out what people are consuming in terms of uh, information, we can also find out what people are retaining as in, in their way of following the comments. And we can also find out what people are sharing and finally, we can also find out what people are engaging with to see whether it is positive, negative or neutral by looking at some social media analytics. Now, step two is analyzing the metrics. Now, companies must always implement systems that track the important metrics like web analytics in the external space or the public space of their digital space and also look at their internal data, like looking into their marketing automation dashboards. Compare the current state to certain benchmarks, for example, using historical trends to the current trends and also the industry average performance. What is the most important step is to determine the root cause of why certain metrics perform the way that for example, when we analyze website metrics using search volume data tools, we can then understand what is the behavior of our consumers or our customers that visit our website. Now, this is important because we can then track who are the people that is responsive to uh, positively to our social media or whatever digital content that we put out there. Another way of looking at our digital content is by looking into social listening tools, which is going to be covered a little bit more in the second video. For example, when we put out a Facebook uh, video campaign, lots of metrics that we can use to track the success of that Facebook campaign or whether or not there has been some engagement, uh, reach, whether it has reached people, uh, likes and follows, whether people liked it, and also video retention, how long people have spent on that particular video and what is the result of that digital content in terms of result uh, of using the digital content to transform into sales, which is what we call the click through rates. Now, these can all be accessed through your business page when you set up a Facebook business page, not through a personal page. Always remember that if you want the access to these metrics, you must set up a Facebook business page. Then we can also take, for example, improvement actions. So imagine you have two different campaigns of A and B. We can see out what is uh, the effect of these two campaigns in terms of what is responded, uh, what is uh, responsive positively. We can have a control, which could be the status quo campaign, and we could also put out a variation campaign. Now, then we can see whether people like the new changes or not. 
You see, changes are, aren't always very obvious, so marketers need to use analytical and creative skills to develop these solutions. Like for example, using the AP split testing to allow marketers to make isolated changes until the best performing marketing effort can be achieved. So when we understand what people like and don't like, then we can invest the resources of the company in the areas that need the most improvement. What about certain strategic support metrics? Companies need an overview of the potential revenue available within the market. For example, for market entry and exit. What is the market size and the marketing growth that should be measured? For example, we can use the ROMI or Return on Marketing Investment. Now, ROMI is basically the marketing revenue times the contribution margin divide over the marketing spend. So we need to see four different stages of support metrics. Number one, brand metrics. Number two, customer metrics. Number three, development metrics. And number four is the digital marketing metrics. For this video, we are going to go through the first three and then for the next video, we are going to concentrate more on the digital marketing metrics. So let's start with brand metrics. Brand metrics can be either brand recall from the consumers, which is the ability to retrieve the brand from any memory, brand recognition, which is the ability to confirm that they have had prior exposure to a brand, brand depth, which is the ease to which a brand comes to mind, or we can call it the top of mind branding, and also the brand breadth, which is the range of usage of scenarios of a brand, whether you can ask the consumers, have they seen the brand in billboards, on Facebook, or on web pages, or magazines, or any other way that they, can, uh, that they will be exposed to the brand. So the ability to retrieve a brand from a memory, you always ask your consumers, when you think of a soda, you think of what is the brand? When you think of fast food, what do you think of? And so on and so forth. So brand recalls will guide our decisions every day because the more that they can uh, recall a brand, that means the more that the brand sticks into the mind of the consumers. And therefore, it has a very high brand metrics. Now, can you recognize these logos without the brand name. The first one, the second one, and the third one. Take some time. Yes, if you notice that the first one is actually the Monster Energy Drink, the second one is DreamWorks Animation, and the third one is a technology company called Cisco. So this shows that they have very strong brand recognition, even without the name post quite uh, 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 apparently in front of you. So another thing that we can use is the brand equity matrix. Now we looked into this in week one, which is basically the effective market share times the relative price times the durability. Now the effective market share is the weighted average of the brand's market share in all the segments weighted by each segment's proportion of sales. And then we can times this with the relative price, which is the price of our brand over the price of other brands, and then times the durability, which is also the percentage of the customers who continue to purchase in a brand in the following year or the following time period. Next, we want to look into the customer metrics. We can always track customer satisfaction by looking at people's renewal rates, their likeliness to recommend, their effectiveness of online customer service, and their views towards online customers. What we want to do is to engage and also enlarge the customer lifetime value. How much does the customer worth to the company to focus on the long-term value of a single customer brings to the company. For example, we want to see what is their margin, which is the customer revenue minus the cost it takes to service the customer, the retention rate, which is the percentage of the customer who remain loyal over time, and the discount rate, which is the cost of the capital for the organization. Taking all this into consideration, then we can calculate the customer lifetime value which is the margin, 
times the retention rate over 1 plus the discount rate minus the retention. So imagine Sephora as a customer profit. So the company makes off a customer. What is the profit that the company makes off a customer or a customer group over a period of time? This is where we want to highlight the customer lifetime value. So the customer profit is the customer value minus the customer cost or the cost of gaining the customer and uh, allowing you to retain whatever money that they have spent. We seek to acknowledge the customer value and really, really highlight this customer value to them. Customer loyalty programs are often used to increase customer profits. So in the case of Sephora, they had a point-based program where customers get points for each dollar that they spend and can redeem them on beauty supply products at the checkout. So this means that every time you spend $1 on a customer to, to get them to spend, they spend more than the $1 and therefore creates more profit. Check out what this program is in the Sephora Beauty Insider program. Now, let me show you a very quick video explanation on how you calculate Romi and customer lifetime value. So after watching that video, you understand now that it's very important for us to continue to keep um, uh, extracting customer lifetime value from a returning customer so that we have more money uh, extracted out from a single customer in retaining the customer. So we spend less on acquiring and more on retention. What are some of the development matrix that we want to see? Now, in development matrix, we want to measure a company's ability to leverage competitive advantage and products and services development. When we develop a product, we want to see whether or not we can develop the product using low cost metrics, customization metrics, quality metrics and responsiveness metrics, and also innovation metrics. That means how well is a new product being developed and with the lowest cost, but with the highest maximum returns. Let's go through each one. Low cost metrics is basically measuring the ability to deliver goods and services at a low Customization matrix is the measure of the ability to tailor products and customers and services to customers, but still get the maximum effect. If you look at it, we can include modular designs, configuration systems, and flexible manufacturing, and also just-in-time inventor. As an example, Dell allows customers to configure and customize their PC to their liking using online configuration tools. This can also be seen by looking at how Nike allows their customers to customize their shoes. Quality matrix is also another example. 
ensuring that the companies produce high quality products and services so that they do not have to spend money on, on product recall and also spend money on uh, uh, re recalibrating -cal their service for their product defects. Now, this makes make sure that you do the products or manufacture the product one time and well. This includes getting lots of good certifications, training the employee involvement, and etc. For example, hospitals often conduct ongoing training for surgical staff to ensure that they are constantly delivering top quality healthcare. Then there is also the responsiveness matrix. Measures whether companies are attentive to the customer's needs. Now, customers' complaints are always going to be a thing. It's how we ensure that we meet these complaints in a timely, accurate, and also courteous manner that is most important. This includes the development speed, attentiveness to needs, and also how we respond to market feedback. Many companies release new updates in the App Store to better, uh, to, to better the user's experience. So therefore, when the uh, customers give comments that they want something fixed in the in the app or they want something new or a new flavor then we respond uh, proactively to the customers for example there is an example of mars bars that has created uh, new um, uh, flavors of chili flavors in china Check out this example of mass chili flavors in China and you will see the case as a responsiveness matrix uh, done very well. There is also the innovation matrix. Now the innovation matrix measures the ability of the company to innovate and develop a mix of new offerings. This measures the levels of breakthrough products, next generation products, major enhancement and minor enhancements and correction. Like when you have new iPhones coming out with new uh, additions or also new um, variations of the same products or even new packaging. Now, marketing is no longer about the stuff that you make, but it is all about the stories that you tell. And this is what Seth Godin has mentioned. You got to first think about who are the consumers online. And think about how we can appreciate and also communicate with these consumers. There are many consumer behavior models that needs to change from the traditional consumer behavior models because of the new digital space. It is a social science discipline that, con that is continually changing and it helps us to predict or explain a wide range of consumer decisions. This is based on demographic, psychographic, and also behavioral variables. There are certain questions that we need to ask before we put out a marketing campaign in the digital space. Firstly, we get to ask ourselves, how do we stand out among so many different brands? Secondly, if we are operating in many, many different platforms, how do we ensure that the message that we put out there is coherent? that the message that we say on our Facebook is the same as the message that we say on our mobile app is the same message that we say on our social media. We must also understand what is our focus because budget is limited so that we make sure that we have the good resource allocation for our consumers. Measurement and metrics always measure what is needed to be measured and always make sure that we transform our digital marketing plans to sales. Using a multi-channel marketing plan is always a good option. That means we maximize our uh, uh, exposure with websites, traditional online marketing, which is emails or even search engines, using social media, mobile marketing, because everybody's on their phones these days, and we can reach the customer wherever they are, but also not forgetting our traditional media as well to complement each other, to have an integrated plan and a coherent message that the consumers can feel confident and proud of. So 
when we talk about a digital brand, we must always talk about how do we stand out from the crowd. What is the one thing that will capture people's attention? What is the context that we want to display in terms of what our brand stands for? Are we clear in our message? Do we have a congruent, coherent flow and plan when we uh, bring our people through our digital experience? Does our digital brand have a credible uh, source of reference and also a credible name that we can latch on to? Always making sure that when we put things online, that we don't just put it as facts, but we create a whole experience that allows the consumers to have a closing and a continuance of a call to action, which can result in developing sales or getting them to ask questions even more so that we make them stay longer in the website and we have more chances to build an online relationship with whatever digital consumers that we have. Now, because that we can build content so easily these days from our digital brand, we need to leverage on the internet marketing technologies. Internet main impacts on marketing is because we are now able to see a wide variety of content coming out from the digital space. The scope of marketing communications has broadened because of the way that we can now use so many different types of internet marketing technologies. The richness of the marketing communication has also increased. We can now use video, audio, pictures, and not just limited to text. And some of these information are not just static, but they can also be dynamic and more importantly, interactive and engaging. The information out there is so dense because there is so much of information that the internet has allowed it to flow inwards and outwards. So the marketplace has also been expanded, but the opportunities are also there. There is always the, re the, 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 the effect of us reaching people in their mobile spaces because it has expanded our mobile marketing reach. Remember, we, it's no more the first moment of truth. Now we can reach our customers in a place uh, not bounded by time, not bounded by geography, and not bounded by cultural or language difference. So. In creating content, we must remember that we want to create a customer relationship. The content on a website or any digital platform functions to establish our brand identity and to ensure that it becomes top of mind for our customer. This is how we differentiate our products. Use good online videos to explain what is good online branding. Anchor the brand online in the minds and the perceptions of the consumers and which is central for all the marketing messages that we want to use, especially in engaging in the social media space. We also want to make sure that our content is not just facts talking about our uh, online um, digital brand, but we also want to ensure that we inform and educate customers. Is there a cause that we as the brand could use to reach more people and to get them to be more engaged with us? And then we have also the power now because of the tools to shape the customer experience using QR and AR. Now I'm going to explain a little bit on QR and AR function. Now, because of online creative videos, we can now use minimum information to create online innovative content. Just look at this uh, Netflix content on my left hand side. This is a content where Netflix uses to communicate with the uh, consumers. So when they communicate, they are uh, experiencing a way of curiosity and again, the longer a person communicates with a brand, then the likelihood of the person to stay with the brand will be there. Another way that has come out from China is to do influencer marketing. Now, I'm going to play a video 
for you from this uh, lady on what she has done in terms of showing you how she uses influential marketing. Now, let me explain to you what just happened. The lady, the young lady is selling clothes online and she is doing it live. What she is doing is just giving out very, very simple information about the clothes that she is selling. But the guy in the back is also monitoring the comments that she is getting from the online social media that the consumers are watching her. Now, the consumers can then straight away ask questions more about the products that's being sold. And she can attend to the questions directly to the consumers. This is a very classic way of reaching out to people who want to know about information. And the more information that people ask, the more information that they get, the likelihood of them purchasing right there and then online is very high. So this is a great way of creating um, instant sales through live content marketing. You can also use quick response uh, quotes to help people to go to websites very quickly without having them typing in. Try to use this particular uh, quick response um, website to create your own QR code. My QR code uh, establishes my own digital branding, as you can see here. See if you can create one of your own. Now, in terms of augmented reality, he has changed the way uh, that businesses run their engagement with their customers online. This is extremely fun and easy to do if you are allowing yourself to use the right kind of tools. For example, IKEA allows you to put uh, the uh, furniture that you've seen on a catalogue into your digital space and to see how it looks without having to move the actual physical uh, furniture. Sephora, on the other hand, allows you to use an app to see how you look in their latest makeup without having you actually try on the products. And also Topshop allows you to look into a digital mirror to see how you look in a dress without actually having you to touch the dress. Also, manufacturing has evolved in customization using augmented reality. Using Manufacturing customization augmented reality allows the users to tweak whatever uh, conventional products they have to their liking and it allows them to make, shift and design their own products as well. Because the new way of doing manufacturing is no longer going through the retailers, but now manufacturing can go through directly from the manufacturers to the customers using a digitalized customization augmented reality uh, app. In the content creation space as well, education has also changed where you can use AR Google animals to engage more with the audience, but you can also use this in the entertainment space as well. So at the end of the day, what is the message that you want your consumers to know. Three key important messages. What are you offering? Why should the consumers pick you out of everything? That means what is so appealing about you? Make sure that it's clear about what you're offering. And finally, ensure that there is a good continuance and closing in your digital brand. Get the the consumers to interact more with you, ask more questions, engage them, and finally get them to 
have a good clear call to action. Now that could be helping them to buy instantly online when they engage with the brand. This ends the video for part one. In part two, I'm going to be explaining more about the power of social media and we're going to delve deeper into the types of digital online analytics and how we can use Google Trends and Google Analytics to get more information on how our marketing efforts are doing. Thank you very much and I'll see you in part two.